us if you can. Today we're in uh, Daniel chapter 2. We're going to be looking at Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Nebuchadnezzar's dream, chapter 2, the book of Daniel. As you know, last week we began our study of the book of Daniel. And uh, we've entered into the second chapter now, beginning at verse 1 and reading till uh, verse 9. Daniel writes, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. But the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. Sounds like your boss, huh? How, except for employees here. Uh, however, <laughs> if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time, because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you, for you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. Now, as we begin, the second chapter of Daniel is one of the most famous chapters in the entire Bible. Because this particular chapter uh, has the most comprehensive picture given of world history from 605 B.C. to the second coming of Christ. And this period of time is referred to as the uh, times of the Gentiles. Jesus, speaking of the times of the Gentiles, in Luke 21, 24, said, Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at chapter 2 of the book of Daniel that gives to us this, uh, this panorama of history. In this chapter, two basic questions will be answered. The first question is, what does the future hold for the nation of Israel? And the second question is, with the destruction of the Jewish temple, will Israel cease to exist as a nation? We'll see in this particular chapter that those answers will be given to us. As we begin and look at verses 1 through 3, notice how he says, In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. So this event occurs in the second full year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, the third year of Daniel's captivity. And now Daniel is serving before the king. The king has been having a series of troubling dreams, and he's very upset, and obviously he can't sleep. So the king gives a command to call the magicians, the astrologers, sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. In other words, because he's very troubled and he's unable to sleep, he turns to his religion. And what he's doing, as it says here in verse 2, and refers to these magicians and astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans, is he's actually calling in what is referred to as the wise men of Babylon. Later, in, later on in the same chapter, in, uh, in verse 27, you see that, that these four uh, types or groups are really making up the one group called the wise men. Because it says in uh, verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, and then he gives these other groups. And so we know that the men that he's calling into his presence to interpret the dream constitute what are called the wise men. The wise men of Babylon. Now notice with me there are four different categories that are listed here. First he refers to the magicians. The word magician actually has as its root word uh, the word pen, a pen. And these are the scholars who are learned in sacred writings and are uh, knowledgeable of magic and astrology. He speaks of the astrologers who study the stars to predict the future. It also speaks of a conjurer, an enchanter, an exorcist, or a mutterer. He speaks of the sorcerers. These are the ones who use the potions and incantations. These are the ones who practice witchcraft. He also has what is referred to as the Chaldeans, which is called the priestly class of Babylon. They were the highest level of the wise men in Babylon. And so what he does is he calls in his religious counselors. Now notice what he says in verse 3. It says, The king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now the Chaldeans spoke, and beginning here in verse 4, up to the end of chapter 7, they use the uh, 
Aramaic language. Up to this point, it's been in Hebrew. And up to verse 28 of chapter 7, it will be in another language called Aramaic. And then in chapter 8, it picks up in Hebrew again. It says, The Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, and this is what they said. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. And so they begin at that point by simply giving to him a, uh, an oriental courtesy when they say, live forever. And then they say, well, let us know the dream. But notice verse 5. The king answers and says to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. You need to tell me what it is. Now, when he says, my decision is firm, it's another way of saying, basically, I've forgotten the dream, and so I'm going to ask you to remind me of it. So he gives them an option, and I want you to see it. Either you tell me the dream, or you end up dead. Obviously, he doubts their accuracy. Not only that, he's tired and cranky. He hasn't slept well. So he's not in any mood to mess around. Now, these people were commonly recognized as experts at dream analysis. And that's why he calls them. Now, as I develop this, let me say something very quickly here. In the Old Testament, God used dreams to communicate. In Job chapter 33, verses 14 through 16, we read, God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. In the book of Numbers, chapter 12, verse 6, he said, Hear now my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. So the Lord would use dreams to communicate what he wanted to communicate to his people. And not only would he speak to his people, but you might find this interesting, but there are different accounts where he actually will give a dream to a pagan, to an unbeliever. You see it here in, in the case of Nebuchadnezzar. We also saw it in the case of a man by the name of Abimelech. There was a time in the life of Abraham and Sarah where Abraham was entering into a land, and he was concerned that he was going to be uh, killed for, for his wife Sarah's sake. And in Genesis, in chapter 20, you might want to turn there for just a moment. I want to read this to you. Genesis chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. We read, Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. And so the Lord, what an encouraging dream that would be, by the way, huh? <laughs> you are a dead man. The Lord would communicate, and uh, he did communicate in various times through dreams. He would, dream, he would give dreams to prophets who would be able to communicate that to the people, but he also would communicate occasionally to pagans. And that's what we're seeing take place here back in Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar has received a dream. And God is going to use this dream, by the way, and the failure of the uh, Chaldeans in interpreting it and in the success that he gives to Daniel uh, to differentiate between the pagan religion of Babylon and the true faith of Israel. And this is what we're going to be seeing here. And so notice with me again that God has given to this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, a dream that has disturbed him. He's called his dream analyst to find out what it means. And so they do what is normal. They walk up to him and they say, okay, tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. Well, he's not going for that. So he says to them, listen, either you tell me the dream or I'll cut you up and I'll destroy your homes. Now, in verse 7, they answer again and said, Well, let the king tell the servants, his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time, because you see that my decision's firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there's only one decree for you, for you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. And so that's a very simple test. If you really have you know, uh, an ability to, to analyze and to know, and you've got the secret wisdom, this really ought not to be too difficult for you. So he's saying again, my decision is firm. There's no way that I'm going to change my mind. I want you to remind me of what I have dreamed. And if you can do that, uh, then I'll know that you're the genuine article. Now notice their response. The Chaldeans answered in verse 10, the king, and said, 
There's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requires, and there's no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason, the king was angry and was very furious, and he gave a command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now, they're confessing at this point their obvious inability. They're, they're basically confessing, we are unable to do this. Only the gods can do what you're asking for, and we have no contact with them. Now, that's an interesting and very important confession. Because today we have people who don't seem to understand that, and that's why they call the psychic hotline. They don't understand that. If you have no relationship with God, how can you be able to give this wisdom from God? How can you have these kinds of abilities if you have no contact with God? And so there, that's a very interesting confession. We don't have contact with the gods. They're, they're, they don't dwell amongst men. Therefore, we can't communicate or speak to them or do anything like that. And in this, we see the, the reality of the pagan religious system versus the reality of the God of Israel who communicates to those whom he loves. This is what we see revealed to us right in front of us. The pagans are simply saying, we don't have that power. We have no communion with him. Now, he's angry, obviously. And so he sends the order. I want you to begin rounding up all of the wise men. Now, the majority of them were centered in the city of Babylon. So they're beginning to get them. They're herding them together. And then he's going to make a public spectacle of them. And he's going to have a, a public execution of all of these useless useless Chaldeans. So it says in verse 13, the decree went out, they began killing the wise men, they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. In verse 14, then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon, he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. So notice how Daniel responds. I want you to see this in verse 14. It says, with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch. In other words, as Daniel begins to speak to Arioch, this, this uh, very powerful man, he uses discretion and he portrays himself with calmness and wisdom. He's asking for time. But God is going to show him favor. In Proverbs 16, verse 7, the Bible says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And so as he's speaking to him, he's saying, I need some time. So notice what happens in verse 17. Daniel went to his house, and he made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning the secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Notice what he did, guys. It's very important. Notice what he did. Two things I want to point out very briefly. One is he secured believing friends. He went and gathered believing friends. Because in the communion of friends who love the Lord, there's a strengthening of faith. And I really believe that when you're in a situation that calls for calling upon the Lord. It's a wonderful thing when you have friends who have faith in God and know the power of prayer. So that's the first thing he does, is he approaches his friends, and second, they have a prayer meeting. And I want you to see what he does here. I want you to see how they begin to cry out to God for mercy. In verse 18, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning the secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. They knew their situation was desperate, and they knew there was only one who could deliver them, and that was going to be God. You need to remember that King Nebuchadnezzar is the most powerful king on the earth, and when he says, you're going to die, that's all there is to it. And unless God were to change the heart of the king, then the king's decision would be firm. Proverbs tell us that the, the king's heart is in the Lord's hand, and like the rivers of water, water he turneth them whithersoever he will. And so they begin to seek the mercy of God in prayer. And one of the things I really believe with all of my heart, and it's becoming more and more fervent belief in my life, is that much of uh, the things that we go through, we go through because we haven't delivered these things to the Lord in prayer. A lot of times we try and seek our own wisdom or our own way to get out of the problem. But Daniel knew that his life was in the balance. 
He knew that there was no way he's going to get out of this. And he had to go to the Lord. He didn't gather a bunch of party hardy friends and say, hey, man, we've got to do something. He went and took out, he took out some of the guys that he knew the best who loved the Lord. And he said, guys, we've got to get on our faces before God because we're dead meat. Because he's going to slaughter everybody. And it wasn't just for himself, by the way, that he was praying. In the mercy that God had placed in Daniel's heart, he's also praying for the rest of those people there. Because he has ministry that he's concerned with, and he wants to make sure that that ministry is fulfilled. And so notice what happens. In verse 19, then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and understanding or knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. I want you to see how he responds to the Lord. He gives him glory and praise. I praise you, God. I thank you, God. You have shown me mercy and you've shown me your goodness. I thank you that you have preserved my life. I thank you because all things are open before you and not a single thing is hidden. And you know everything. So I could trust you. And we've come to you and we've asked you to reveal. And you have. And I thank you for it. So he praises the Lord. Notice verse 24. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Ariah quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Balteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on, bed, on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching. And behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And so he begins to give him first his dream. Now Daniel goes to Arioch, as we saw in verses 24 through 28. And Daniel has a full confidence now that God has given him the dream and its interpretation. And therefore, as he approaches him, he's extremely poised. Now I want you to see something here that you might not have noticed. I want you to see a contrast that develops immediately. First, I want you to see verse 25. It says, Ariah quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives. He didn't find anybody. What's he doing? He's trying to get credit for this. He's taking a big chance, by the way. What if Daniel's wrong? But I want you to notice the contrast. Ariah tries to get part of the credit for this, and he didn't have anything to do with it. Daniel had spoken with him and had asked him what's going on. Eric had told him. He said, I've got to get some time. He got some time, come back, and says, well, I know 
what's going on. And then Ariel comes in, you almost see this petty ruler, you know, puffing his chest out like, yeah, I discovered somebody. He didn't discover anybody. Daniel was being moved by the Lord. I want you to contrast that with the attitude of Daniel. Because the king says, can you make this interpretation known? And Daniel makes it very clear, the knowledge of this is not with men. But there is a God in heaven. What does he do? He humbles himself before the king and he says, there's no way I'm taking any credit for God's revelation. It didn't come with me. I simply begged him and in mercy God gave to me this revelation. And so I want you to see the contrast there. Daniel did not in any way, shape or form take it unto himself. Now, he says, this interpretation was given because God has given to me mercy. In verses 29 through 35, when he says, As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while you were on your bed. He begins to now reveal a panorama of history through an image. And as you look at this, we're going to see it in some detail in just a moment. But as I was reading this to you, I want you to notice with me that the metals that are spoken of in this image that he describes are, are descending in value. They begin with gold, but they end up with that which is really useless. And so they have a descending value. They're progressively inferior. And this is intended to reveal the quality of man's kingdoms because what he is speaking about here is kingdoms of man. And you need to see that. As he's speaking of these kingdoms, these are kingdoms of man. These are the best that man can do and the glory that man can provide. And that's what we're seeing here. Now this particular series that he's giving is actually ruling nations. We'll be looking at those nations more closely as you remain here in our study with us in Daniel. You'll see this in chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapter 11 as we see more detail concerning these nations. But that's what he's referring to. Now in verses 36 through 45, we end up now with the dream. Now let's look at it. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom, inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, Inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters all things, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Now let's look a little bit at this dream in a little more detail. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king, Daniel says. Now, what I'm about to share with you is a panorama of human history. I already mentioned in my introduction that it refers to a time that is called the times of the Gentiles. And what we have here in this particular passage is four human kingdoms described and one kingdom that is made without human hands. That's the kingdom of God. And as we look at this, we note that he's already mentioned, and we've already seen this, but in verses 37 and 38, he says to him, you are the head of gold. So we know that the first kingdom that he's referring to, and you have to picture this, it's a statue of a man and a head of gold. And what it was is a picture of Nebuchadnezzar who was standing before this statue. And as he was standing before this statue, the statue was immense. It was incredibly large. 
And in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he's standing before this incredibly large statue, and he sees the descending value from gold, silver, bronze, down to the iron mixed with clay and all. And as he was looking at that, it caused him great concern. And something also that's interesting, and I ought to say it at first, is the, the density or the gravity or the weight of the metals descends in weight. Gold is heavier than the very bottom, and therefore it's top-heavy. And he's looking at this enormous top-heavy thing with gold uh, as the head, and he's wondering, what does that represent? Well, Daniel begins to tell him, you are the head of gold. Now, the head of gold being the most valuable gives to us the value of the kingdom. And so he's saying to him, you have absolute authority. And the Babylonian rulers had absolute law. If a Babylonian king said, I'm going to cut you in pieces and burn your house down, that was all there was to it. There was nothing you could do to stop him. He had absolute authority. There was no council. There was no group of people. There was nothing that could keep him from doing what he wanted to do. And if he chose to do that, the only thing that his, his uh, people that were under him could do was obey his command. And that's why he says, you have this incredible domain. You have this power. I want you to see how he puts it in verse 38. Wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of heaven, he's given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. What is he saying that when he says, bird come, dog go, you know, giraffe jump, that they do that? No, what he's saying is you have absolute authority over all domain. That's just a picture of your authority. And so he's saying, as the king of Babylon, you are ruler. Now, the Babylonian kingdom lasted from 605 to 538 under Nebuchadnezzar. And then it's replaced with a second king. You see that in verse 39. In verse 39, we see the chest and arms of silver. That represents the Medo-Persian Empire. They ruled from 538 to 330 B.C. They were incredibly powerful, the Medo-Persians, but they had something that the Babylonians didn't have. The Medo-Persian king was bound by the law. If he were to decree something, then it was fixed in the law of the Medo-Persians. You'll see this later on as we get into our study, because on one occasion, we'll see this later, the Medo-Persian king uh, makes a decree and then discovers that that decree he'd been, he'd been uh, tricked into making, and thus he tries all night to get it removed, but he can't because he's bound by the law. Whereas a Babylonian king could change his mind, Nebuchadnezzar could change his mind, the Medo-Persian could not. That's a descending kingdom. It's an inferior one, and thus it's portrayed as silver. In verse 39, you have the bronze. That represents the Greek empire. That ruled from 330 to 30 BC. The Greeks conquered the Medo-Persians, and it was a military aristocracy. The, the uh, most famous leader of the uh, Greeks, you all know, is Alexander the Great. And they were an incredible empire, but they were a military aristocracy inferior to the Medo-Persians. And finally, you have in verse 40, the nation of Rome, the fourth kingdom. He says, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters all things. This was a picture of the power of the Romans. The Romans were known for military strength, and they were famous for their ability to crush all resistance with an iron heel. They were bound by law and weakened by Caesar worship. And as you see, they are going descending in value all the way down. Now notice in verses 41 through 43, he says this, Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay." Now we'll look at a, a couple of other things. I want you to see how he says the kingdom will be a mixture of strength and weakness. Now notice verse 43. He speaks of iron mixed with ceramic clay. He says they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. The final form of the kingdom will include diverse elements, possibly race, possibly cultural, political parties, sectional interests, cultural diversities, 
and it will prevent the final form of the kingdom from having a real unity. Speaking of a massive empire that ultimately implodes. There's so many things taking place in it, and Rome never really had a unity. They had the Roman peace, but the Romans would conquer and they would bring into the Roman culture the various elements that they had conquered. There never really was a true culture. As a matter of fact, when I was studying world history, I still remember our teacher talking about the Greeks and how the Greeks would develop things and they had a culture, but the Romans were never really a cultural giant, but rather they had a, uh, an acquisition. They would take what was invented by other cultures and they would inculcate them into the Roman culture. And so they weren't genius in terms of producing culture, they were rather genius in taking it and bringing it in. The problem is, as they did that, they never really had a unity. And that's the point that's being make, made here. And so this kingdom that he's speaking about, this fourth kingdom, is the kingdom of Rome. Now as we look at this, I want you to note that he's describing a man, and thus we get down to the feet and the toes. Notice verse 42, it says, The toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. Now the ten toes have a prophetic overview. The last form of the Roman Empire is going to have ten nations. Ten nations. And this is the last day's kingdom that will be destroyed by Jesus when he returns. In Daniel chapter 7, let's just take a quick peek over there into chapter 7. In verses 7 and 8, and this really is just basically a foundation. We'll be looking in detail when we get into chapter 7. But in Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, we read these words, After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by its roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Without getting into too much detail, this is a picture of the last day's kingdom of Rome that is revived. The ones that are being spoken of are ten nation confederacy. The little horn is another way that we know that is referring to the Antichrist. This is speaking of a kingdom and a leader here. And we'll see that in detail when we get there and I'll take you through this slowly. But notice verses 23 and 24 of the same chapter, because he tells us, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. This is a picture of the Antichrist's rise to power. The Roman Empire in various forms has continued to exist, and that's the point that's being made. The United States is patterned after, after many, many elements of the nation of Rome. And in many various forms, the Roman Empire continues to exist even unto the day that we're, we're standing here right now. And so what's going to happen, and this is just a quick picture, is this kingdom this fourth kingdom really never ceases to exist, though the Roman Empire, of course, uh, fell in 14, I think it was 1453. Uh, yet, it still has an influence throughout history. Um, in the end, in the latter days, though, there is a kingdom that will arise. It's been called the revived Roman Empire. It will be headed by a military leader by the name that we call him the Antichrist. It'll be a ten-nation confederacy. And in this government established by the Antichrist, it, that is the government that will be in existence when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Revelation chapter 17 gives us the same idea in verses 12 and 13. In Revelation chapter 17 verses 12 and 13, we read, The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. But they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. 
And so there is a kingdom that will be present in the last days that is a form of the revived Roman Empire headed by an Antichrist, also known as the Little Horn. It is this particular kingdom that Daniel's referring to as we turn back to Daniel and we read the next several verses. In verse 44 and 45, it says, In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. So what he's saying to us is this, and we'll look at this now. In the days of these three kings, he says, God will set up a kingdom which shall never end. This is a picture of history in a, in a snapshot. You have Babylon. Babylon is overtaken by the Medo-Persians. The Medo-Persians ultimately are overtaken by the Greeks. The Greeks ultimately are overtaken by the great Roman Empire. The Roman Empire's influence continues throughout history. We end up now in what are called presently the last days. The influence continues to this day. In the last days, an Antichrist, and we'll look at all of this in detail when we get into chapter 7, 8, and 11 especially. But the Antichrist establishes a kingdom. As he establishes this kingdom, he will rule. In his rulership, ultimately, there is one who's going to come to destroy it. The picture that's given to us here in the book of Daniel in chapter 2 is a picture here in verse 35 when it says, The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. The stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The stone is an image of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know that? Well, I'll give you two scriptures. First, let's read together Luke chapter 20, verses 17 and 18. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 20, verses 17 and 18... Jesus is having a discussion. Some people are challenging him, and he responds to them. And he says, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Jesus was using the image of a stone to represent himself here. And so he's speaking of his judgment or his ability to grind them into powder. It's the same basic image that we saw just a moment ago in Daniel. And then by cross-referencing cross that with Revelation chapter 19, and I'm going to read a few verses from there, beginning at verse 11, we see this picture of the return of Christ. In Revelation 19, verse 11, then I saw heaven opened, behold a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. 
I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his, his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. That's the picture that Daniel is giving to us that is elaborated by John, the second coming of Christ, in which he comes and destroys the kingdom of the Antichrist, and he brings in what is called the millennial reign. And so back in Daniel, in closing, this is so hard for me to try and say, oh, there's so much more, but we'll look at it. You know we will. In verse 46, King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and the revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. The king is not becoming a believer in the God of Israel, by the way, not here. He's simply saying, your God's better than the gods I've been worshiping. True story uh, was given to us at the uh, pastor's conference. A minister in India, min minister who goes to India, was sharing concerning something that had occurred. There were some people in a particular uh, uh, group of missionaries going to a particular uh, tribe in India, uh, uh, um, a village in India, and then they went in. And as they went into this particular village, the people in the village said to them, um, if you don't leave our village, we're going to beat you up and kill you. And so they said, it's probably a good idea to leave. And so they did. But as they left the village, they stopped on the outskirts in the jungle there. And they began to pray. And they said, God, we know that you called us to this village. We know that you sent us here. There's, there's no reason we'd be here if you didn't give to us a desire and a vision to come here. And, and, and that's why we're here, Lord. And, and would you please open the door so we can go back into the village and preach your, your word. And as they were praying, uh, a man was walking through the, uh, coming out of the jungle on a trail towards them. And he stops and he's beginning to speak to them. And he asks them, uh, what are you guys doing here? What are you doing? And they said, we want to go into that village and we want to share about our God. It turns out that the man who was there walking in and stopped to talk to them was the village chieftain. And so he says, well, come back in with me. And so he brought him back in, and because he was the chief of the village, nobody there could stop these people from coming in. When they came in, they were given an opportunity to share. As they began to share, some of the villagers walked up and said to them, Listen, we have some children here who are very ill. Uh, do you think maybe your God can do something for them? And they said, well, we can only ask, but our God has the ability to heal. Bring them to us. And so they brought very, various sick people to these Christians. And they said, God, you are God. You have the ability to heal. And would you show them your power? Because they have been worshiping in darkness all of this time. And you know what? The Lord answered their prayer. And the people began to get healed. And when the people began to get healed, they were able to establish a church there. And they were able to, able to baptize believers into fellowship with Christ. And from that village, now they've spread out from that area and they've been planting churches around there. See, the pagans worship God, but they worship Him in ignorance. They have a concept of a God, but no revelation of the true God. And so they'll do all they can and, and all that they believe and they'll go again, uh, with all of their tradition and all of that. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and it troubled him. He didn't know what to do about it, so he calls in the wise men. These are the wisest people in, in, his, his, uh, in his culture. And he says, listen, you need to tell me what my dream was. It's disturbed me and I can't sleep. They say, well, tell us. The dream will give you the interpretation. No, you're buying time. I can't even really remember it. But if you will tell me it, I'll remember it. And then it'll also prove that you're real. Well, you're asking us to do something that no man has ever been asked to do, they say to him. They say, we, do, we can't do that because this is knowledge that is secured by the gods. And only the gods know. And they don't dwell with men. But you've got this Jewish young man by the name of Daniel. He just finished three years of Babylonian college. And he's serving the king. And then he hears about it and he says, well, you know what? 
Let's get into a prayer meeting. He and his buddies pray, God, you've got to show us mercy. God reveals. He goes to Nebuchadnezzar. We're able to do it. He reveals the descending kingdoms, and he says to him, you are the king of kings. You are the head of gold. And as he begins to share this, and he begins to give the details, this is what you were doing. Nebuchadnezzar see, sees this, and he says, undoubtedly, you've got inside information. My men didn't have the ability to communicate a single thing. As a matter of fact, I know that they were dodging this because they could ultimately die, because I told them they would. But you came with poise and confidence, and you gave to me the insight that nobody else could give me. Therefore, the God that you serve is a great and mighty God. And he gives to him the recognition as a man of God because Daniel was in touch with his God. And that's the same kind of thing, maybe not as major, of course, but it's the same kind of thing that the Lord constantly does in our lives too, guys, by the way. When you're on the job and people know that you're a Christian and they walk up to you after seeing you and watching you, and sometimes you know this is true, they'll be watching you from the corner of the eye to see what you're like. And they see that you're honest. They see that you're there on time. They see that you don't take long breaks. They see that you don't join in with uh, looking at the porn or telling the dirty jokes or gossiping in the office. They see that there's a quality about you that's really different. They may even speak to you on occasion and say, what's it you know, all about? What do you do? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. Oh, okay, fine. That's all I was wondering. But later on, they walk up to you, don't they? And they'll say, by the way, when you're talking to a man upstairs, why don't you remember me? My, I'm having problems with my wife. Don't they? Next time you're talking to the, the big guy up there, they'll say, would you, would you remember my kid? He's in the hospital right now. I'm concerned about him. And then they walk away. They disappear. That's happened to me. It happens to you. They'll say, you know what? I know you go to church. Would you think of me sometime? What are they saying to you? They're saying, my religion doesn't work. But there's something about yours that does. I'm going to take a chance with you. And you want to know something? Daniel was lifted in the eyes of the king because Daniel's God is a great God. And you will be raised in the eyes of your friends when you worship and serve the true God of heaven. And that's what we're seeing take place here. Incredible prophecy that we will look at in detail in chapter 7, 8, and 11. But the point is, he's saying, listen, king, the God of heaven whom I serve knows all things. He knows what you dreamed. He knows what's bothering you, and by the way, this is what it was. And now he's, great, he's gaining credibility in such a way that later on you're going to see his impact is incredible in the kingdom of Babylon. So we'll stop here, and we'll pick up next time in chapter 3.